Hey friends, this is Marilyn from tarotclarity.com and today's video is one of my film commentaries focused on the film Dodsworth, a 1936 film directed by William Wyler. It starred Walter Houston. Houston. Some of you may know his son, John Houston, who is a director today. And his, uh, Walter Houston's granddaughter, Angelica Houston, you may be familiar with her have, having been Morticia Adams in a remake of The Adams Family. Ruth Chatterton is uh, a, a, the other actress in the film. This was, I think, Ruth Chatter Chatterton's last great role. Mary Astor, who is probably a, about my favorite you know, actress of this period of time. And then a cast of supporting characters who are also popular, if you're familiar with uh, classic film. Paul Lucas, David Niven, who some of you may recognize, um, you know, a, mo a more, uh, you know, current actor. I, I don't know if he's passed away. He must have passed away by now. Maria Auspenskaya, who is a little old lady who's like always pulled out in films when they need like extremely wise old women. Spring Byington, some of you may be familiar with Spring Byington from the film You Can't Take It With You with the great Lionel Barrymore and uh, Jean Arthur, and another character actor who I've seen in many films, but I didn't know his name. I had to look it up myself, named Gregory Gay. Now, this film takes place, or it, it was created in 1936. It was based on a novel by Sinclair Lewis. Now, for those of you who are familiar with the Haynes Code of Morality, the Morality Code imposed upon film, that came out in like 1934. So after 1934, a lot of the, the, the 30s films were silly, frivolous, you know, I, you know, films, a lot of times that's when the musicals came out because they had to, you know, entertain people and they couldn't use adult subject matter. But Dodsworth is, a, is really has a, adult subject matter. It's a, it's a, it's not a silly, frivolous kind of film, you know, it's, you know, it's a, it's a mature film, and I think it's, it's a very smart film, and uh, for that reason, I uh, want to talk about it. In fact, I think it's probably my favorite film of all time, and if it's not, it's in the top three. Now, for those of you who have never seen Dad's Worth Now, I mean it. I don't, you know, it, it's, it means I'm going to lose a couple people viewing this, but if you haven't seen Dad's Worth, don't let me spoil it for you. Pause, go watch it on TCM. It's on demand until April 18th, if you're watching this in April of 2024, go watch it and come back to this um, because I really wouldn't want to ruin it for you. It's a great movie. Okay, the opening scene of Dodsworth has Sam Dodsworth looking out of the window of his office. And you can see from the window the words Dodsworth Motors on the wall of the building. So you know that this is a important man, an industrial magnate. Quickly, after we see that image of him looking out the window, the camera cuts to a newspaper article that says Dodsworth retires or Dodsworth sells his business. So we know that this Dodsworth character has sold his business. Next thing we know, Oh, and, and as he leaves the company, you know, you see his workers all like showing him respect and how much they're going to miss him. So you know that although he's a uh, very successful industrial magnate, that his workers loved him. And so that you get the sense that he's a decent human being. He's a good guy. He arrives home to the kind of palatial estate most folks only dream of and in keeping with somebody who has more money than God, right? And he also, no surprise, you know, is married to a woman who appears to be a bit younger than he is. Now we get the sense, in just a few minutes into the film, we get a glimpse into the mechanics of their marriage. She's been a dutiful wife to a magnate of, a magnate of industry, doing all the social things that have been expected of her, tea socials, etc., with women that bore her to tears, doing all the things that, you know, in order to support her husband, in his pursuit of becoming successful. But we also get the sense that she's been bored, you know. Her their adult daughter has now just gotten you know, gotten married and she I think we get the sense that she might have coerced him to retire probably before he wa he was wanting to retire. We get the sense maybe a little bit that she might have had something to do with his retirement. Um <clears throat> and you know she, 
as they you, as you hear their dialogue, you 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 see that she wants adventure. You know, she's still young enough to enjoy life, and uh, he kind of comes around to that idea, and he's like, "You're right. You know, I owe it to myself, and we owe it to ourselves." You know. Now, before they take off, they decide that they're going to do a what they decide to do is is take a cruise on a, a crossing on the Queen Mary, you know, transatlantic. Um, trip uh, from New York to uh, the UK and you get the sense in their conversation that she wants a new lease on life she wants to begin life all over again whereas he yet if you read between the lines he wants to be an American on a vacation he's willing to go over for six months you know to see and sightsee and he wants to see all of Europe but he thinks of himself as an American and you can tell that he has every intention of coming home you can also tell that she has no, dis no such desire to return home. You know, she's willing to be an expatriate. You know, she's willing to leave and have a whole, whole new life elsewhere. So a little bit, there's a little bit of innuendo between the lines. If you pay attention carefully, you start to see that that's how each of them are thinking. They have an, a, a, a friend, couple, you know, um, that is probably closer to Sam's age than Fran's age, who come to see them off before they go on their trip. And the, while the women are in the other room talking, the husband of the two, and I don't recall his name, says to Sam, your wife, you know, he throws shade at, at, at Sam's wife, kind of suggesting you let her, you know, bully you into retiring early. He doesn't say it like that, but you kind of get that that's what this is about. You know, she, you let her like, run the roost. You let her tell you, you know, that it's time to retire. And, you know, why did you let her do that? That kind of thing. But, you know, that was 1936. And that might have been the sentiment of a lot of people in those days. Now, 80 years later, when we're watching this film, we, I see it as a, an, a, a mature woman, um, a modern woman. And I understand Fran's position. You know, I've been a dutiful wife for 20 years that we were married. You know, I, I did everything I was supposed to do that bored me to tears just to make you successful. Before, you know, life goes on too much and before life passes us by, I want to have a good time, you know. So I completely get it. So for me, watching this film, the beginning clips, the beginning, you know, scenes of, of this, um, I think she's a very relatable person. She might not have been relatable to, you know, an audience in 1936, but I think to... Uh, some of us, you know, in, by today's standards, she would be much more relatable. Uh, but at any rate, so they go on this trip. Now, <clears throat> once aboard the Queen Mary, the conflict between them begins to become evident. Fran attracts the attention of another man, played by the suave David Niven, who is, of course, English. And the trip it, from New York to the UK, it would make sense that there would be a Englishman on board going back to his homeland, right? So, uh, for the whole week that they're on the ship, because I know that the, the Queen Mary takes a, seven days to, to cross, um, Franeline, you know, hangs out with this young guy. Well, I don't know if he's a young guy, but she hangs out with David Niven's character. His name is Captain Lockhart. And, and the two of them do things together that, you know, Sam doesn't really want to do. She wants to dance. She wants to, you know, have a lot of fun and do all those activities that Sam's just not interested in doing. He wants to do other things. What it is he wants to do, I don't know. But, you know, she is running around the ship with, with Captain Lockhart. On the last night of the voyage, by chance, Sam meets the lovely Edith Courtright, who is a stunning beauty. Of course, she's played by Mary Astor. Edith Courtright is an American expatriate divorcee, divorcee living in Naples, Italy. She's a sophisticated woman of the world. Edith is confident and independent, right? Now, at the same time that Sam meets this woman, David Niven's character and Fran, uh, Captain Lockhart and Fran, go to... Fran and Sam's suite to just look out the balcony. You know, I think they go back to the room for her to get her wrap or something like that. And she intends to leave the room to go back and dance. But Captain, Cor uh, Captain uh, Lockhart says, 
hold on, let's just enjoy the moment from the balcony. Let's have a romantic moment. And uh, she's like, I'm a married woman, you know. And Captain Lockhart expresses like, well, this whole trip, you know, we've kind of been having this thing. And now that you're landing in the UK, you know, we can kind of continue this thing, you know. And, you know, Fran is just like, what are you talking about? I'm a married woman. I'm happily married. And, and he's, you know, and he, she kind of like wants to throw him out of her room. But Captain Lockhart kind of humiliates her because, you know, he says, well, you're act, you act like you're offended. What did you think was happening here? You know, he, you, know you, you pretend you're a woman of the world, but really you're just a naive child, you know? So she's extremely offended, throws him out of the room and tells Sam that now they can't stay in England as they had planned. And as Sam had really hoped, because as it turns out, he has English ancestry and he was really looking forward to like, you know, learning about the land of Shakespeare and whatever else really floated his boat, right? She's like, well, we can't stay here because everyone in high society, because this guy had a title or something, he was, you know, he was, you know, a, a prominent figure in, in the UK. He's going to tell everybody that I'm just a hick, you know, so I'm, I, I'm too humiliated to stay here. So now they're forced not to stay in the UK. And she said, she insists that they just go from port to Paris and skip the UK altogether. So, you know, Sam's not really happy about that, but he ac acquiesces to his wife. And so the next thing you know is they're in, in Paris. But before they move, before they go to Paris, you know, she does say to him, you have to keep your eye on me, Sam. I don't trust myself because I may get into trouble again. So please keep your eye on me because I don't want to get into trouble. You know, I, 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 don't, I don't really want us to fall apart. You know, I want to have fun, but... I don't trust myself because I don't know that I won't get into trouble again. And, and Sam says, you know, oh, okay, you know, but you've got to keep in mind that we're hicks just like they think we are, you know, we're just, we're just, you know, we're, we're not these kind of people. We're, we're different people, you know? Anyway, um, so, you know, while they're in Paris, Fran immediately makes friends with other expatriates and other Parisian uh, people who are actually, you know, Parisian or other Europeans. So she just totally gets into the social scene, you know, and, and, and wants to become one, you know, she wants to become a member of society. Whereas Sam continues to see himself as an American sightseeing in Europe. So he just wants to, he wants to see the Eiffel Tower. He wants to do this and he wants to see the Champs-Élysées. He wants to do all those kinds of things. Whereas I don't think Fran even ever does any of those things. All she wants to do is hobnob with uh, the elite. She's a little bit of a snob, you know, and she just wants to, you know, go to the better, you know, dining places and do the social things, you know, where Sam is happy to be amongst the people and hang out at the cafes and just have a good time. And, and, and she begins, uh, Fran begins to um, criticize him, you know, because she's like, how could you be seen at a cafe? How, you know, how common of you, you know? And he's like, well, I want to see the sights, you know? And, and, and she really just wants to be high society. And he's not, he's not going that way. So once again, they go separate ways. You know, she hangs out with, she makes new friends that he's not part of. And um, he's left to his own devices to sightsee. So, of course, the same behavior happens again. She ditches Sam. Sam does what he wants, and she does what she wants. And Fran mingles. This time, Fran begins a flirtation that eventually becomes an affair with a gentleman called Iceland. I forget his first name. Iceland. Iceland. Played by Paul Lucas. And uh, one night, Sam and Fran... Uh, host a dinner party at their hotel room in Paris, celebrating Fran's 35th birthday party. Now, we all know that Fran is older than 35, you know, but she passes herself off at 35. Sam is in his 50s. And, uh, but she'll only admit that she's 35 years old. And so she has a group of friends come over to have dinner with them and 
to celebrate at their home. One of them is the gentleman that she's looking to have an affair with. The other one is Edith Courtright. Now, that's the second question I'm, I have for the cards because what is Edith still doing in Paris when she came over from the United States? She had a land in she had a land in um, the UK because that's where the ship ends up. But she, from the from the UK, she would have immediately gone back to Naples, which is where she lived. So what the heck was she doing in Paris weeks later, weeks into their trip? What is she still doing in Paris, or what is she even doing in Paris at all? So that's a question I'm going to put to the cards. But at any rate, very conveniently, she's around socially, and so they invite her to the party. Um, now, Edith, uh, Fran makes a crack to Edith, saying, I hope I look as good as you when I'm your age, you know. And, of course, Edith, being a wise, recognizes that <laughs> Fran is already her age, but she's too classy to call her out on it. But she says, oh dear, you are most assuredly going to look as good as I do at my age, in parentheses, because you already are my age. But she doesn't say it. She just says it like that, which is very classy of her. But Fran catches on to the innuendo. And uh, so she knows that she knows that Edith you know, has her number. Now, I'm sorry, I have to be putting in this. <laughs> Edith, while she's at this dinner party, picks up on the fact that Fran is probably entering into an affair with this Iceland guy, you know? Now, Sam is too naive to catch on. He's, he's too trusting of his marriage. He just, he's of the school of thought. He's been married to Fran for 20 some years or whatever it is. And it never occurs to him in a million years that his wife would have an, uh, you know, have an affair, you know? Now, after what happened on the boat and after she said to him, keep your eye on me because I can't trust myself, you would think he would have caught on, but he didn't, you know? He just doesn't catch on at all. He just, it never even occurs to him that she would have an affair or, or entertain an affair, but Edith is catching on. And so when they, the two women have a moment alone together as they're, as the guests are leaving, Edith says to her, don't, don't do this, you know? And of course, Fran pretends that she doesn't know what Edith is referring to, but she does. So Edith tries to warn her, don't do that, you know? You're gonna ruin your life, you know? So Edith leaves and she says she's going to Italy. And uh, if you're ever in Italy, look me up. Now, as they continue to stay in Paris, there's lots of little things that happen. Like for example, you know, Edith, excuse me, Fran is constantly throwing French terms, French words, you know, and when Sam tries to use this, the, the, you know, the French language, you know, he says it <laughs> with, you know, terrible accents. So she's always correcting his, she's always cor correcting his pronunciation of words. And, she, you know, it turns out that she's apologizing for him to her friends because she's embarrassed of him because he's a hick, you know, he's, he's just like not sophisticated. He doesn't belong in the crowd that she wants them to belong to. And, you know, she feels like she has to make apologies for him. He doesn't, he just doesn't fit in. He says, you know what? I think it's time we go back to the United States. We've done enough here and I'm starting to lose you. I'm starting to sense that stuff isn't good between us. It's time we go back. You asked me to be in charge of you, and I'm telling you, this is what we're going to do. And she's like, well, I'm not going. Me and my girlfriend have rented a villa on an island in Switzerland, and uh, I'm planning on doing it. And he's like, well, you could have mentioned it. How, how are you renting an island <laughs> with your friend, and you're not mentioning it to me, you know? So, you know, she's like, well, I'm not going with you. You go by yourself, you know? And he's like, well, I guess I'll stay. And she's like, no, you can't stay. It's killing me that you're here. You, you need to go. You need to go back to the United States and leave me alone and let me have fun. So he's devastated. He's crushed. But he goes back to the United States and he just agrees to allow her to stay for an undetermined amount of time. And while he comes back to the United States and he, you know, reconnects with his daughter, who in the meanwhile the daughter and her new husband are staying at the Dodsworth house while their own home is being built. So they happen to be at the property. And once again, the couple, the friend of their of, of Sam's shows up 
Spring Byington, and I don't remember the husband's, the actor's name, who was the husband, and they show up at the house as well. And uh, he's very irritable. He, you know, argumentative with his daughter, you know, and, and the, the woman, Spring Byington's character, I forget what her name is. I mean, it began with an M. Maybe it was something like Maisie or something like that. She understands that something is going on in their marriage. And so she, you know, calmly asks Sam a few questions. And uh, he allows Maisie to read a letter that the wife wrote. And in the in, you know, and he tells Macy that well, I, I I sent a cable for her to come home immediately. I, I made arrangements for her to come home, and she refuses to come home. So not only did he have to come home without her, but when he cabled her now a few weeks later to say come home, she refuses to come home. So Macy reads the letter that the wife wrote, and she says, "Who is this guy Arnold Iceland? Who is he?" And so by her asking. Sam who that is. I guess it puts the idea in Sam's head that he's Arnold Iceland is someone that Sam needs to be concerned about. So he thinks about it and he decides he's going to go back to the he's going to go back to Europe and he's going to reconnect with his wife. But in the meanwhile, what he does before he leaves for Europe, he uh he hires a detective to find out where Arnold Iceland has been living and finds out that it's been at the same location where Fran has been living. So upon his arrival to where to, to reconnect with uh, Fran in Europe, he tricks Arnold to arrive at the hotel where he and Fran are staying to force Arnold and Fran to face one another in his presence. And of course we find out that, you know, their, 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 their affair is confirmed. Fran and Arnold break up because, you know, Fran and Fran is ashamed that, you know, she hurt her husband and that she had an affair and she's ashamed that she's been caught. And he asks her, do you want a divorce? And she says, no, I don't want a divorce. I was just having fun, you know? So um, Arnold is a dignified gentleman. He leaves and he leaves Fran and Sam to patch up their marriage and uh, start all over again, which Sam says, let's start all over again, you know, that kind of thing. So they're back in... Yeah, I don't know what where they are at this point. I don't remember what country they met at together, um, but they have a they have a hotel suite some somewhere in Europe. Um, when Fran arranged for their hotel suite, she arranged for two bedrooms because she no longer wants to sleep with him because she's already over that you know over the marriage I guess. And, you know, Sam comes, you know, tells her the news, you know, that their daughter's pregnant. And, and Fran's like, well, she didn't tell me. And, and Sam says, well, she told me to tell you. It's a nice surprise when I come back. Now, in the meanwhile, Fran is, again, of, of course, has a, has planned a social evening out dancing. And Sam doesn't want to go dancing. Sam wants to stay home and talk on the phone with the daughter and, you know, talk about how she's doing and stuff like that. But Fran's like, well, don't make a phone call because my friends are coming over and I don't want them to know I'm going to be a grandmother, you know, because she's so obsessed by aging. She, I don't want them to know I'm a grandmother, so shh, don't, don't even mention it. So he's like, whatever, Fran. So he stays home and, and Fran goes out with a much younger gentleman dancing and just having a good time, you know. And it turns out that this young man, his name is Kurt, has a title, he's a baron. Um, so Fran and Kurt go out and they dance. Sam stays home, calls his daughter, goes to bed early. <laughs> so when Fran comes home, when the evening is over and uh, she lets Kurt into their suite and they sit and they talk and she's just, you know, having a friendly conversation. It's revealed that Kurt has fallen in love with her and Kurt says, if you were only free, I would marry you. I love you. I want to marry you. So 
Fran is very interested in this because, of course, the gentleman has a title. She's got the money, but he's got the title. So she says, you want to marry me? And he's like, oh, I love you so much. I want to marry you. So that was her ticket out. So Fran decides. Hmm. She puts it on the back burner. She kisses him goodnight. You know, Sam comes to her bedroom because they have, the, as I mentioned, two different, two different bedrooms. Knocks on her door. And uh, she puts up clothing to, like, cover herself. And he's like, has it come to this that you have to cover yourself and, you know, I have to be afraid to knock on your door? Because in earlier scenes, there were scenes where they were intimate, where like, they were, you know, getting dressed and he was in his, you know, you know, <laughs> underpants and, you know, had his sock garters on, you know, with a, with a long, you know, dressed shirt and stuff like that. And you saw her disrobing in front of him. So there's like this decline in their intimacy that is evident. And uh, he's like, what's going on? You know, like, are we drifting that far apart? And she, sa and she attacks him and she says, you know what? We have. And, you know, as a matter of fact, I'm marrying Kurt. He's asked me to marry him today and I'm marrying him. I want a divorce. So, of course, you know, he, you know they, they have it out. And um, Sam acquiesces and agrees to separate from her. The divorce will occur, in, I think, in Vienna, and she, he has to stay in Europe in order to be available for the divorce, however long it takes. So he's decided to just stick around in Europe, you know, to do the sightseeing that he had always wanted to do from the beginning. And he's just loose in Europe by himself. And you could tell that there are, you know, some, at certain sometimes when he's at certain cafes, like single women who are, you know, there's a, one scene at least where he's at a cafe and a, and a woman who's sitting alone like notices him, you know. So he is attractive to other women, but he has no eyes for anyone other than Fran. And he, um, he's just so sad. <laughs> he just goes around Europe aimlessly, just sightseeing. And he's seen everything 12 times until one day, one day, he ends up in Italy. And guess who lives in Italy? <laughs> Edith. But, you know, he didn't look her up, you know, because at this stage, he's just like so forlorn. He's not looking anybody up. He's just traveling from country to country, wasting time until the divorce comes through. So once again, he has a chance encounter where he meets Edith Courtright. I think they met in a post office or something like that. So in their brief conversation, she realizes, you know, he tells her that they're getting divorced. You know, he and Fran are getting divorced. And, you know, he's, she, she's sympathetic toward him. And she feels like he's, you know, she could feel his dejection and she knows he's heartbroken. And she's like, come out to my place for lunch. So they go to her place for lunch. She's real excited because he hasn't spoken two words to another human being in six months or whatever. And so they go to her place, which is a beautiful villa, um, over with you know with a balcony view over a lake, uh, you know either a lake or an ocean, um, you know like the because there's a view of the Queen Mary as it turns out later on. But at any rate, so this she has this beautiful beautiful place where she lives, and uh, she propositions him and she says, why don't you why don't you stay here with me? And he's like, well, what about, what about the way it looks? You know, like, how, it, you know, is that like, could it be done like that? But they're in Europe, you know? And so, you know, Edith says to him, well, uh, yeah, it's going to look like that. You know, it, it's probably going to look like that, but that doesn't mean it has to be like that, you know? And uh, we can be platonic about it and just stay with me. And who cares what people think, you know? Like, you know, you could leave your puritanical American ways at home and you can relax and have fun. So they do. He agrees and they stay together. And of course, in the time that they're together, they end up falling in love and they make plans for their future together. Now, of course, <laughs> that's so fast with the happy ending, <laughs> right? Um, as it turns out, the young baron that Fran has agreed to marry must, it turns out, get permission from his mother, the Baroness, the formidable Maria Auskinspaya, whatever her name is, Auskinspaya, uh, you know, I forget, I, I don't have it written down in front of me. Um, that's his mother, right? So he has to get permission from the formidable Baroness to marry, to get married. 
So the Baroness comes to the house, comes to the suite wherever they're living, and she starts to voice a few objections regarding their marriage, and she refuses to give permission for their marriage. She cites, well, you're a divorcee, or you will be a divorcee, that's scandalous, you know, we're not having that, you know, and, and, uh, and uh, you know, France says, well, that's true, but I'm really rich, and I know that you lost your fortune in the war, and my money will be a welcome asset, you know, so maybe you can overlook the fact that I'm divorced because money talks, nobody walks. And the Baroness was like, nah, you know, no, it's not good enough. And so Fran is perplexed. She doesn't understand. What could you possibly have against me? And so the wise old woman says to her son, leave the room. I want to speak to Fran by myself. So the young, the young Kurt leaves the room and the old woman looks at Fran straight on and says, I know you're a lot older than my son. Has it ever occurred to you the unhappiness you will have being the old woman to a young husband? And that really hit a nerve for Fran because of course that was the problem in her marriage with her husband. He was an older man, she was the younger woman. She wanted to have fun. And the old woman saying, well imagine you're the old wife of a young husband. You don't think that's gonna happen to you, right? So that really hit a nerve with Fran. And despite the young Baron saying, we'll wait until, you know, we'll wait a year, or mom will come around and she'll end up loving you. And of course, you know, unspoken is, well, maybe she'll die. <laughs> and then when she dies, we can have our life together. But Fran loses respect for the Baron because she's, you know, and then it's not just that she loses respect for the Baron, but she also realizes what the old lady said hit a nerve and that it was true because it might not happen tomorrow, but in five or 10 years, she'll be in the same boat that her husband's in, right? Now, one of the interesting things that I do want to mention is that while Edith and Sam are in Naples, the weather is balmy and it's summertime and it's beautiful. It's occurring at the same exact time that Kurt and Fran are in Vienna. And out their window, there must be 35 feet of snow because they're having this incredible blizzard. You, it, it's just so much snow that it's like, there must be like mounds and mounds and piles and piles and feet and feet of snow because that's how much snow is coming down in front of the window. Now, I know, I, I checked today's weather between Venice and, excuse me, between Vienna and Naples, and they, have the, they share the same temperature within a few degrees. So the temp it can't possibly be springtime in, or summertime in, in, in Naples and be like 40 below <laughs> over in Vienna. So it was an interesting thing that the director did to show how end of life or the end of her happiness in Vienna is illustrated by all the snow and the death, you know, the death of the season. Whereas the Walter Houston character, Sam and Edith, are flourishing in springtime and summer and having the time of their lives. So, after this occurs between the Baroness and Fran, Fran decides to call the marriage off, and she just decides, I'm going back to Sam. That's what I'm going to do, you know? Because Sam has always acquiesced to her in the past, so she begins making phone calls to Sam, in Naples at Edith's place. Now, in the course of the day, Fran has tried to make a few phone calls to Naples and Edith smells the rat because every time the phone rings and the maid answers, she says, oh, it's somebody from Vienna. And Edith, understanding that it's probably Fran, doesn't want Fran to interfere with their life. So she keeps telling the housekeeper to say, tell her nobody's home, tell her she has the wrong number. But Fran won't give up and she keeps calling and she keeps calling and she keeps calling. In the meanwhile, of course, as I mentioned, Sam and Edith have fallen in love and have projected a life together. They have plans for their future. But eventually, one of these phone calls, the uh, housemaid, says, Mr. Dodsworth, the telephone's for you. He gets on the phone. It's Fran. 
And you can see the expression on his face, you know, when Fran says, oh, the marriage is over, we can get back together, you know? And, you know, he's crushed, but he's a dutiful husband and he feels like I gotta go back to my wife, you know? He hangs up the phone and he says, I gotta go back to her, you know, she, the marriage is off and, you know, she's my wife, you know? And Edith is, mis you know, Edith is pissed, you know, she's like, we have a life together, we have plans together, you're, you love me, you, she's, you're miserable with her, she's an awful person, why do you want to go back to her? And he defends his position by saying, well, she's my wife, and, you know, I'm, she's what I know, she's what I'm used to, you know, and, and, and she'll have a great deal of humiliation to face, you know, socially, because people know what she was doing. She know, everyone knows she was divorcing me to marry someone else. And when that marriage doesn't pull through, she's going to have a lot of, she's going to have to face disgrace. You know, she's going to have to face humiliation. And, you know, I want to be by her side when that happens. So that's how we leave it, right? So the next scene we see Fran and Sam are back on the Queen Mary going back to the United States. And uh, you can see, you know, while they're sitting together on the boat, that Sam is, he begrudges it, you know. He's not like, oh, I'm so happy to be back with you. He's kind of like sitting there, and he's really looking at Fran with a critical eye. And everything she says, he can understand, he, he recognizes that she hasn't changed at all. And, you know, she, her, you know he, she makes a crack about their friend Maisie back in the United States, and he doesn't like that. He just, like, don't be cracking on her. And he can see that, you know, she's going to be ten times the snob that she used to be. And she, you know, you know, she doesn't understand how they can let anybody in on first class. And, you know, like, just in the five minutes that they're together on the boat, he smells the rat, and he says to himself... I can't do this with this woman, you know, she's just, I can't. But the, the, the straw that broke the camel's back is when she said, I thought of apologizing to you, Sam, but after all, this is half your fault, just as much as it's mine, you know, basically because you didn't stop me from letting this happen. And he looks at her incredulously like, are you kidding me? And at that moment, he decides, I can't do this. So he, you know, goes to a porter, says, please get my suitcase, bring it to me. He goes back to his wife's table and says, I'm out of here. I am not crossing with you. I'm staying. And she's like, what do you mean you're staying, you know? And right before the boat takes off, he hops off the boat and the boat whistle, you know, sounds. And, you know, Fran is screaming, he's gone ashore, he's gone ashore. But her voice is canceled out because the ship is so loud, you can barely hear what she's saying. So naturally, um, Edith is home and she's devastated and she's heartbroken. And she, as I mentioned before, has a view of the port where the Queen Mary has been stationed. Although, I don't know what it was doing in Naples, because really it's a ship that goes from the UK to the United States. So that's like a kind of like a, an, an anomaly, right? But at any rate, it's a movie. <laughs> so the willing suspension of disbelief. So, she, so you know, Edith sees the Queen Mary and she knows that Sam, or she feels that Sam is on the boat and she watches the boat take off and she's just standing on her balcony and you want to cry, you know, because she, she's just... Her, you know, her, her, everything about her newfound happiness has just gone down the toilet. But as she's watching the Queen Mary take off, in the meanwhile, she notices that this little motor, motorized sailboat is coming really close to her shore. And she's like, she starts to notice it, you know, and she starts peeking at it and she realizes there's another person on the sh on the little sailboat besides Pepe, who is a like a local local fisherman, and she peeks and she realizes that it's Sam, and she almost falls over the balcony. You wave it to him, and oh my God, she, it's just like a great scene where she's so happy and she just she just can't contain her joy to the extent where she's about to fall over the balcony, and then we realize he, you know she realizes that Sam came back to her. So it's a great ending, and it just, it's just such a feel-good movie. I mean, of course, it's not a good ending for Fran, 
but it's a, it's a happy ending for Edith and Sam. Now, I did mention that I had a few questions. One question is, what was Edith doing on the ship from the U.S. to the U.K. in the first place? Like, what was it that she was doing in the U.S. to be coming, you know, coming back to the to 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 Europe on the ship? Number two, why was Edith still in Paris to attend the birthday dinner for Fran when really she was only coming back to the to the uh, to Europe in order to go back to Naples, right? So she sh wouldn't have been hanging out in Paris. So what what was the reason? And number three, how did things turn out for Fran once she returned to the United States by herself? Now, before I do the questions, I also want to mention a few other things about the film and what was going on behind the scenes. Mary Astor, who I mentioned before when I did the film The Maltese Falcon, and, and some people think that she wasn't a great choice for The Maltese Falcon because The Maltese Falcon, the character she played in that role, um, was a shady woman with a like a, with a, with a less than stellar past, you know, like a shady lady, you know, but Mary Astor is so like sophisticated an actress and such a beautiful actress and so refined that it's hard to imagine her being a shady character. But in, the, in those days, in 1946, I think it was when um, the Maltese Falcon came out, people would have remembered Mary Astor's scandal that she had right when this movie Dodsworth was taking place in 3536. Now in 3536, Mary Astor was involved in a custody battle with her then ex-husband, something Thorpe, Dr. Thorpe. And um, they, you know, it was, a, it was a nasty custody, you know, battle over their daughter whose name was Marilyn. And Thorpe got a hold of Mary Astor's journal, her diary which ended up being like really salacious. She had many affairs, um, and he did too. They had an open marriage. They had agreed to have an open marriage, but like she wrote about her affairs, and you know he figured, oh, I'm just going to bring this to court, and I'm going to show she's an unfit woman because she has affairs with these people. But then um, the judge was not having it because he's like, you know, I'm not really interested in stuff that happened after you were divorced. I'm only interested in stuff... I'm not interested in stuff that happened while you were married. I'm only interested in stuff that happened, you know, since since your divorce. And if this happened while you were married, it's irrelevant, you know. Plus, there was enough dirt in that diary talking about her ex-husband and what he was doing because he had relationships too. So the ex-husband said, well, you, I, I don't want you to see those parts. I just want you to see the parts where Mary's having an affair. And the judge is like, time out, dude. If we're going to show this diary, we're going to read everything, including what you did. So the diary was dismissed, and Mary Astor got through the trial by um, becoming Edith Courtright, and she handled herself like Edith Courtright. Now, of course, the jury and nobody in the you know during that period of time knew anything about how Edith Courtright was because the film hadn't come out yet. So. Mary Astor portrayed herself as the very sophisticated, elegant, and above reproach character, Edith Courtright. So that's how she got through the trial, and that's probably how she won custody, because she was just so dignified that they, she won the case. Now, the other thing that's worth noting is that in those days, and I guess, uh, I guess it's been mentioned like on TCM by one of the speakers, uh, you know, said that um, in those days, you know, because Hollywood, of course, is a, a movie town, Mary Astor filmed all day. She got up at six in the morning, filmed all day, and the courts allowed her to testify in the evening. And so she was home. She went out the door at six o'clock in the morning to do the film and didn't get home at night until midnight, you know, because she had to do the trial, you know, and Ruth Chatterton, the Fran character, said to her, you know, Mary Astor, like, who do you have in your court appearing, you know, you know, a, a being there for you for moral support? And Mary Astor had no one. And Ruth Chatterton appeared with her every night in court and just sat by her side as her moral support. And that gave Mary Astor a lot of clout because, you know, you know, Ruth Chatterton was somebody that everybody knew. And 
for them to see that a, you know, a fellow Hollywood star was there for Mary Astor also, you know, and it helped Mary Astor too, you know, because it really helped her get through it to have somebody in on her side. And uh, so I have to give a shout out to Ruth Chatterton for being like a, a really good friend. Okay, so let's flip the camera and let us do a few readings. Okay, in order to do this, I, I have to use an Italian deck. Absolutely. And so this particular deck is the classic tarot printed by Lo Scarabeo. And it, I believe, is a deck original, originally, um, I think, cr created in 1830, something like that. <clears throat> and I'll tell you the name. Hold on. Ah. Okay, so the Tarot Classic was designed in 1835 by Carlo della Rocca and was one of the most important Lombard engravers in Milan at that time. So it's a, an extremely beautiful deck. This particular deck is a mini size and can be purchased for $20 or less over on Amazon. So it's not an expensive deck at all. I've already shuffled the cards, but I'm just doing a few shuffles on camera. So you can see that it's not a staged, it's not a staged read. And remember, the first question is, what was Edith doing on the ship from the US to the UK in the first place? Remember, she was already an expatriate, firmly, firmly ensconced and living in Naples. The lover's card. Okay. A page of coin and the seven of swords. Okay, so I wouldn't interpret the page as, you know, one of her children that, you know, maybe she was going back to see one of her children because it's never indicated anywhere in the film that she had any children. So it seems as though she was a, a woman who never had children. So I don't think that's the case. Now you notice that this uh, page is holding a coin and valets can also be, you know, messages or, you know, uh, you know, represent errands that are being run. Now, the lover's card is over here. Now, I don't think it was because she was like settling something with an ex-husband in the United States because I think we understand that her ex-husband um, was English. So I don't think that's that. I don't think she was settling any kind of monetary any kind of monetary thing with her ex-partner because he was an American and there would be no reason to go to the United States to settle anything then with, a, with somebody who's not American. Now, sometimes the lover card can be seen as a choice being made, but I don't think that that's the case here because we don't have a gentleman choosing between two women. We have some type of an official, right? almost like they're being granted permission to get married, right? Or they're, they're being granted permission to, you know, go under a marital contract. We have, you know, we have Cupid here, you know, kind of throwing the arrow. So maybe she needed some type of permission to do something um, that was, re that required a partnership. Maybe she... Maybe she had to settle her affairs as it became increasingly evident that she was, you know, becoming an expatriate and that she, maybe she wasn't returning. And so maybe she had to do whatever it took to be granted permission to move on, right? The seven, seven is a number of transition of moving forward, right? So maybe she had to return to the United States, not for love, but to... Um, be granted permission maybe she had to appear maybe she had to appear in court on her own behalf in order to be granted 
you know, maybe to lose, maybe she was like losing her American citizenship or something like that. That wouldn't be the normal way that I would interpret this particular card, but in the context of the question, I don't think it has anything to do with love. I don't think it even has to do with any kind of choice. You know, she was already divorced. So unless she had a love affair, you know, a long distance love affair, she came out to resolve it and it didn't work out and she came back, which is a possibility, I imagine. But I kind of think this kind of, in the context of the question, this is kind of reminding me of like she needed permission to do something. Maybe she had to testify on her own behalf in order to cut loose ends and move forward. If we look at the Quint card, we see that it's, you know, six and seven is 13, which is the death card, which reinforces in my own mind that she had to cut ties. If she had to do something in order to get permission to cut ties and, you know, free herself in order to become, uh, you know, maybe she just wanted to, you know, surrender her United States citizenship. All right. The next question was, why was Edith still in Paris? In order, you know, to re recall, she had dinner um, to celebrate Fran's 35th, you know, 35th birthday when she should have already been in Naples by then. She, she, had, she would have had no reason to go from the UK to Paris to just hang out. <laughs> right so let me let me pause the film so I can shuffle off camera and I'll be right back alrighty so why was Edith still in Paris to be able to attend the dinner party when she really realistically probably would not have been there Eight of Batons. Wow, another, another, another page, another valet. And a knight. And then we wouldn't count these two for a quint card, but this is the eight. So let's pull the justice card. So maybe Whatever she had to do to tie up loose ends in the United States, she had to continue that, you know, in Europe. You know, we have a confrontation here between individuals. Um, we have the Eight of Patons, and then we have Justice. So Justice, to me... You know, as the quint card, you know, tells me that the clues for this row probably have to do with some kind of legal formality that she was required to participate in. Now, I think her ex-husband was English, so I don't think her ex-husband would have been French, and I don't think she would have had to t loose, you know, ties up in Paris over any loose ends she might have had with an ex-husband. However. Maybe she herself just decided to, after she tied up whatever loose ends she might have had in the UK, if she had any, maybe she just decided to sightsee a little bit herself, you know? In the context of the question, I see eight batons as a restoration of social order. So she was there in order to bring calm or peace or to bring harmony to a social situation where there's a confrontation. Now, I don't know why she would have hung around for them. Um, I don't know why she would have hung around for those two unless, unless they kept taught, you know, and, and unless, unless she was herself sightseeing and they, they, they kind of kept, uh, you know, tabs on her and, and she with them and maybe they saw each other socially, you know, Fran and Sam and Edith, maybe, maybe, maybe she was traveling throughout Europe and, and just taking the opportunity to cross the continent, you know, before she got back to, you know, Naples 
maybe she was taking the opportunity to uh, do a little bit of social stuff. And um, I guess that's possible, you know. But then the Quint card being justice kind of suggests to me that there's some kind of legal thing that she had to do in the process. So who knows? Maybe she had to do some kind of, maybe she had to settle something. Maybe she had to do, I don't know. Um, let me go off camera for a few minutes and think it through. You know, in a way, maybe from the trip that she, when she saw them on the boat, maybe she knew that something was up, you know? And maybe, you know, maybe she was a little bit more, uh, maybe she was keeping her eye on them, you know? You know, maybe she saw that things were not so great with that couple. Maybe she was interested in him. And maybe, you know, she was interested in keeping her eye on them to see how things worked out. You know, maybe she thought she could be a calming voice. She did warn Fran. Maybe she thought she could be a calming voice to help set Fran on track. You know, Fran was acting impetuous socially, right? This could be an immature individual. The suit of batons I see as a social suit. So maybe she saw Fran as being kind of immature and impetuous and, you know, rushing head head into a, a, an affair of the heart. You know, maybe she was trying to be the voice of reason. Maybe, you know, maybe that was part of her reason. You know, maybe she, uh, if she herself had just decided to, you know, just make a little bit of a tour of, of, of Europe before she went home, Maybe she decided to to remain social with them, to try to warn warn Fran and try to get Fran on the right path because she herself ended up divorced and maybe she was lonely, you know, and maybe she saw a similar future for Fran and wanted to, you know, maybe wanted to give her a heads up, like, hey, don't do this, you know. I, I think that's the answer right there. Okay, the last question that I had is, how did Fran make out? <laughs> How did things turn out for Fran once she returned to the United States? And let me go off camera to shuffle, and I'll be right back. Alrighty then. I don't know which way is upright. I guess this way is. And we'll do a few shuffles. Alrighty. How did things turn out for Fran? An emperor, a man of high social rank and standing. Ace of coins, the beginning of the opportunity of a new life with money or involving money. And a king of swords. I think she landed on her feet. I think she ended up hooking up with another man of power. After all, she'd have been very attractive because she had a lot of money. And, you know, she liked men of power. Remember, she was running around with the Baron who had no money, but she liked the title, so she would not be um, adverse to hooking up with somebody who had high rank in the social order. And uh, I guess she married him. I guess she went off with a gentleman and just started her life over again with another powerful gentleman because that's the life she understood. And I think that's the life she continued on with. The, the, the uh, four and one would be, the quint card would be the Pope, which I don't want to bore you looking for it, um, but if we can find it quickly, the Pope would suggest a gentleman, um, In a position of power and so if we look at the king of swords that might suggest that maybe he was uh, another kind of authority figure you know like her husband Sam was the authority and you know industry of automobile making right so maybe she ended up with another similar type of man um, a high-ranking social individual with money, with clout, and with authority. So I guess Fran ended up landing on her feet and doing okay.
So I hope you enjoyed this film, this, this uh, film discussion and the readings based on the film. Until next time, friends, peace, stay well, be kind, and do no harm.